Good morning. It's Monday, January the 4th, and this is The Drill. Thank you, thank you. The prayer of the day. In my word, you will discover the thoughts that I think about you. I have desire that your life be filled with my great peace, not with the evil and turmoil that you will find in the world, which the enemy will try to thrust upon you. My word will help you to see the glorious future I have planned for you and will surround your life with the hope overcoming the evil in this world through my strength and power. Allow my Holy Spirit to fill you up with my supernatural power. With my power, there is nothing the enemy enemy can do to hurt you. My word and my power will help to fill the whole earth, help you to fill the whole earth with my glory. Father, your words tell me to call to you, and you will answer me, and show me great and mighty things which I do not know. I am calling you today. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11, Matthew 10, 1, Psalms 72, 19. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host and the only true conservative in the United States today. Today, Tom Hardy, the importance of metaphysical reality in debating the left, debt, and Keynes, voting for Kelly Leffler, hatred versus righteous indignation, the left's tactics of mirroring, avoidance of direct confrontation by the left, and a lesson from a law and order episode. All that when I come back. Thank you very much. Tom Hardy, an actor, was quoted on Instagram on an account known as Interpreters Lives as saying, quote, you know too much psychology when you can't get mad at people because you understand everyone's reasons for doing everything. And, uh, unquote, he's exactly correct. This is just another way of putting things that I've been saying for a long time. The left wants to neutralize you. They want to defeat you, and they want to defeat you by neutralizing you. If you fail to moralize, then you have been neutralized. Understanding is just another way of becoming neutral. Okay, and uh, nobody's neutral. Neutral is phony, is fake, is wrong. You and I need righteous indignation if we're going to be able to be potent, if we are going to be able to thwart socialism, if we are going to be the bulwark against socialism, we must have righteous indignation. True conservatives acknowledge metaphysical reality and do so out of common sense. Nancy Pelosi and all of her followers refuse to. And so what? Isn't that just an academic issue fit only for mental masturbation? No. There is one area in particular in which ignoring reality has real consequences, and that is the economy. The example is that many people think that the United States is a capitalist economy. It isn't. The United States is not a socialist economy either. There are no real socialist economies in the world, although Venezuela has been giving it a mighty try and uh, with disastrous results. The fact of the matter is, number one, that the whole world has to have the same economic platform, has to have the same economic system. If we don't all operate on the same uh, system, we can't trade. We can't trade with one another. It's just that simple. So... Uh, we're now, we used to be, the whole world used to be on a gold standard or a modified gold standard. We are now in something that's called Keynesian economics. Um, Maynard Keynes or whatever his name was uh, came up with this particular system of uh, printing money and having debt, uh, etc. in order for the government to be able to smooth uh, the economy so that we don't have boom, whether what were called boom and bust cycles. 
we're on a gold standard economy, uh, the economy would be either be running red hot or be ice cold. There seemed to be no happy medium. And the left in this country has been absolutely fascinated with and obsessed with the idea of uh, uh, creating a, a tepid economy in which, in which there's little or no growth. An example of that was Obama's economy, 1% growth. And uh, so anyways, we're, the whole world is now on a Keynesian economic uh, program. We all uh, get, do debt, we print money, and we're, the government is basically involved in the economy in terms of stimulating it and trying to do things to prevent recessions and to uh, prevent uh, depressions, et cetera, and keep the, the economy moving in an upward direction so that uh, it will be, uh, we will experience ever-increasing prosperity. That's the whole purpose of that, of, of Keynesian economics. So, but Keynesian economics is all about not, uh, be, uh, unreality. It's about fantasy. If you we have right now, the United States is I don't know how many dozens of trillions of dollars in debt, uh, fifty trillion or whatever. So that's a heck of a lot of money. And if you spread that out over the, the population of the United States of America, that's a lot of debt per person. Now. The, the unreality part comes with the idea of Keynes is you ignore it. You ignore the debt and you just continue to roll it over. Somebody asked Keynes uh, about his theory and asked them, what about the long run? Keynes' response was, in the long run, we're all dead. And so basically what we're doing is we're going to turn all, all of our debt over to our children. And then our children are turning it over to our grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's an irresponsible uh, way of living. Also, it's psychological. It's deeply psychological. The whole idea is you just keep spending money when you have an economic downturn. And uh, you, as long as everybody remains nice and cool, nobody panics, everything's going to be fine. We just continue to roll over the debt uh, trillions become quadrillions become quintillions and nobody cares because as far as the left is concerned they're nothing but numbers there's nothing real but again the problem is if all you need uh, if one person panics it could be somebody in China one of the Chinese leaders decides that they, that they look at this debt and they can't uh, they can't get their mind around it they get spooked by it like a horse. You spook a horse and they're going to rear up on you. And he, somebody in China gets panicky and decides, we're not going to roll over your debt anymore, United States. We're calling the note. We want you to start paying back, uh, start paying us not just the interest, but we, have the, we want the principal as well. And that may very well set off a chain of events that could be uh, globally catastrophic. Now, uh, because we don't have that kind of money uh, sitting around in our uh, bank accounts uh, in, the, in the treasury. And if we start printing money to cover it, then we're inflating the money supply. A, a loaf of bread ends up costing $10, $12, etc. So, but anyways, the point is, it's deeply psychological. Uh, true conservatives are realistic, and that's why we back our move or return to the gold standard, because the gold standard is realistic. Uh, and But Keynesian economics is part of the left. It's imaginary and it's psychologistic. Um, when I come back, Leo Terrell. Thank you very much. Leo Terrell tweeted that he needed to do more to elect Kelly Leffler. And um, what's interesting about this is that Leo Terrell doesn't live in Georgia. Kelly Leffler is a Georgia senator running for re-election in the uh, runoff elections uh, that are going on right now and uh, particularly tomorrow. And Kelly Leffler, again, is a Georgia senator. Leo Terrell doesn't live in Georgia. So why is he campaigning for her? He is not her constituent, and but he's campaigning for her because of this uh, 
divide that we have in this country, this, uh, I don't know how else to explain except divide or a split between uh, the needs and the wants of the Republican Party and the needs and wants of particular constituents. So as far as all he's concerned, as long as she has an R after her name, he's going to put in as much support as he possibly can to make sure that she gets um, reelected because then she's going to uh, be a team player, fall into line with the rest of the Republican National Committee, and uh, you know, and, and then automatically good things are supposed to happen. The issue here and the reason that we have rhinos, the reason that we have problems with elected officials that uh, conservatives do, we elect somebody who promises to do one thing and then never gets around to doing it. How many people in Congress promise to give us a wall? How many people in Congress promise to give us um, the uh, to destroy uh, Obamacare? Who, how many of them said that we're going to get rid of Planned Parenthood and yet it hasn't been done? Why not? Uh, well, in, in part because we have, again, those are national goals. Those might be good goals for the Republican National Committee, but each person in Congress represents either a district or they represent an entire state. They are sent to Washington not to represent the Republican Party. They are sent there to represent their constituents. And the constituents' needs and goals may be different than uh, and are more likely are different than what the national um, goals are uh, going to be. What happens is you elect somebody, you and I elect somebody, and the, they go to Washington, and one of the first things that happens is that they are put on a committee. They're given a committee assignment. Let's say that they get the Judiciary Committee. They're a senator. And they get in the Judiciary Committee. What happens then is that they're no longer, uh, for the purposes of that committee, representing their constituents. It's not uh, North Carolina, Georgia, Nevada, New Hampshire versus New York, California, uh, Florida, etc. It's the Republicans versus Democrats. Okay, so automatically your representative now is now no longer representing you. They're representing the Republican National Committee. So what's the solution for this? The solution for this is that you need to express, uh, you, and you can do it right now, send um, emails or tweets or whatever to your representatives and tell them that you expect them to put your constituents' needs first and that the party needs come second or third or last for that matter. And you also further expect them uh, to uh, refrain from being on accepting committee assignments because that's where they always go wrong. If they stay off of committees, and committees aren't necessary. They don't need uh, co committees for anything. It's just all it really is for committees is power. Lindsey Graham is the head of, of the committee, uh, the judicial committee. So uh, he ex exerts a, a certain amount of power. When your representatives go to Washington, everybody's supposed to be equal. There's no supervisors in, in, uh, in Congress. Nobody supervises anybody else. So, uh, but with a committee system, we end up with a rank structure. We end up with the ranking member. And uh, the next, you know, so it's a hierarchy. It's almost like a union. It's almost like they're in a union. Who is it that has seniority? And the people that have seniority get to run the committee. And that might look good on their resume and that might give them a sense of prestige, but it doesn't do anything for you and I. So that's the thing you can do. Do it now or send, send a message to your representatives telling them you expect, number one, that they are going to represent your interests before the party's interests. And number two, tell them, get off. If you're on a committee, get off the committee. If you're offered any more committee assignments, no. You say no. So, righteous outrage, righteous indignation versus hatred. The left likes to say that the right is full of hatred. And what they're doing is using hatred as a dysphemism for righteous 
outrage, and righteous indignation. Expressions of anger aren't the same thing, or righteous indignation or righteous outrage is not the same thing as hatred. Okay, you do something that incurs my wrath, for lack of a better term, doesn't mean I hate you. It means that I am outraged by what it is that you have done. And there's plenty of uh, examples in newspaper and other news uh, sources uh, for uh, for those those things that are uh, are and should um, go ahead and uh, ignite, if if you will, uh, righteous outrage or righteous indignation. So um, again, don't let yourself be intimidated when the left is trying to talk about hatred. You say no, 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 not hatred. Righteous outrage or righteous indignation. When I come back, one of the left's favorite tactics is mirroring and how to deal with it. Thank you very much. One of the less favorite tactics is mirroring. And they do this especially when you're going to be expressing um, uh, morals. When you're going to be moralizing, then what they try to do is show you as some sort of a hypocrite. Uh, if you say, I, I'm, uh, I'm opposed to extramarital sex, and then they find out and go looking for uh, evidence that you have been out having affairs. And once they find that uh, any evidence or supposed evidence or just find a way to make something up, then they go out and they say, well, look at this person. They're a hypocrite. On the one hand, they're saying don't have extramarital se- sex. On the other hand, uh, they're doing that. They're having, uh, they're doing exactly that. They don't argue about whether having extramarital sex is uh, right or wrong. They don't argue the right or wrong of that. They do not want to get involved in a binary conversation because if they're shown to be wrong or evil or bad, that is a huge setback for their movement. So they want to avoid that. So what they do is they use hypocrisy as a way of controlling the conversation and shutting up the person on the right. If I am a smoker and I tell other people not to smoke, am I a hypocrite? Who cares? The real question is, am I right to tell other people not to smoke? If I tell them it's not good for your health to smoke, am I right? Yes, that's all that matters. Hypocrisy, you know, maybe I smoke a ton a day or pipe and and all kinds. Maybe I smoke all kinds of things. The only issue here is about right and wrong. So you always want to make sure you steer the conversation to a binary, a right, wrong, evil, good, bad, because the left desperately wants to avoid that conversation. And moralizing is always about drawing those binary distinctions. This is no good. This is good. So don't let them intimidate you with any type of um, uh, mirroring. Okay. And the other thing you can do is, as a counterattack, is you can mirror Put the mirror up to them. When they're talking about having paradise, socialist paradise, and uh, that a part of that is that supposedly people have the right to uh, certain types of health care, but you find out that, uh, for instance, Nancy Pelosi is going out and getting gold-plated health care. She's going out to the finest clinics and talking to the finest doctors. Well, is that paradise? Is that, uh, is that an example of your, uh, your desire for... Uh, equality or that uh, the uh, having everybody get equal access to health care is that an example of it if we move to a gold or not a gold standard but a uh, uh, equal access um, med- medicine single payer is Nancy Pelosi going to give up her doctors is she going to give up her fancy clinics is she going to give up her um, uh, insurance? Congress has insurance. that They're not on the Obama plan. They have their own gold-plated insurance. And they haven't given it up, and they're not going to. But that's the way you can reflect it right back at them. Or make it, uh, even better yet, make it a right and wrong issue. But a good example of the mirroring was uh, there used to be a talk of family values by Newt Gingrich, former uh, Speaker of the House, in, ni- in the mid-1990s. 
And he was on and on about family values, family values. And then uh, somebody went out and did an investigation and found out that Mr. Family Values was in the habit of cheating on his wives. Okay. And Mr. Family Values was using family values as a way of uh, drawing a distinction between uh, proper behavior and the behavior of Bill Clinton, who was a womanizer um, and possible rapist. So uh, then the left jumped on that and said, aha, you're really no different or better than Bill Clinton, so you should shut up. And that's exactly what he did. He resigned under pressure. And uh, the story was, of course, that what he, well, the only difference between um, former Speaker Gingrich and Bill Clinton is that former Speaker Gingrich would marry his mistakes. He would cheat on a wife with somebody else, and then uh, he would eventually then divorce wife number one and marry wife number two. And then he, uh, uh, and it always seemed to happen during a campaign. It was always his campaign secretaries that he was having affairs with. But the point is, he held, they held a mirror to him. He resigned. And so for, it, not only is he shut up, but he's shut up for good because it's tantamount to a confession that he did something wrong. And uh, so he has no longer any um, credibility, uh, especially when it comes to ethics or morals. No, no longer any moral authority. So in that particular case, again, what he should have done is say, whether I do or I don't is... Sorry about that. But anyways, what he should have done was come out and say, it doesn't matter whether I am or I'm not. The question is, am I right or wrong for doing it? I'm wrong for doing it. I shouldn't do it. Bill Clinton is equally wrong for doing what he does, and uh, he shouldn't do it either. That's the, the proper response to that. Um, the left also likes to avoid, and again, I've, I touched on that a little bit earlier, direct confrontation. That's one of the, they hate it. They can't stand it because direct confrontation leads to inevitably a binary conversation. Conversation which you get down to right, wrong, yes, no, good, bad, evil, etc. And if the reason they hate that and the reason they, they fear it is because if they're shown in an argument, a debate, shown to be wrong, bad, evil, etc., that sets back their movement. It may even do irreparable harm or damage to that movement. So they're always interested in avoiding moralizing. Okay, uh, They are always interested in staying away from those binary conversations. So they want conversations to be conducted neutrally. And they want to neutralize conservatives. They want to encourage conservatives to describe rather than to judge. And uh, uh, true conservatives need to go the opposite direction. Judge, point the conversation to a, um, in a, a judgmental direction. For instance, when they come out and they want to make a statement of some sort, uh, it's always good to ask questions. When the left speaks, ask questions. Um, so, uh, for instance, um, if they say, uh, a classic example here would be uh, Scott Baio. He was, uh, got a tweet from uh, some guy, uh, a lefty, who uh, used trigger words to get Scott to overreact. He used trigger words of wuss and uh, uh, asshole, I think it was. And so, the, uh, and Scott ended up uh, um, saying, calling him a shithead. You know, and so um, he did. He shouldn't have done that. Uh, what he should do have done was ask questions. First of all, the guy didn't he call Scott by name. He just said, "Oh, hi there. I thought I'd check in and see how you're doing, you little wuss," and and then went on from there. And what Scott should have done in that in that case is ask him, "Are you talking to me?" Okay. So, again, that's the road to getting it, it down into a binary conversation. If he says, yes, um, uh, so to be clear, you're calling me a wuss. And then, and then you follow up with, are you sure? Those kinds of questions. Because as you go down that road, again, it becomes binary. Uh, once he gets to the point where he's shown to be basically nothing more than a seventh grade punk, uh, the guy that's trying to uh, outrage uh, Scott Baio, 
this, his antagonist is nothing more than a really seventh grade punk because that's, that's what that is. Hey, Mr. Wuss, I haven't heard the word wuss since I was in the seventh grade. But that's the mentality of the left. Junior, welcome back to junior high. You know, so uh, ask questions. Are you sure? How do you know? And you start the conversation down the road to right, wrong, good, bad, etc. And Mr. Lefty doesn't want to go there. So his argument is going to fall apart uh, faster uh, than uh, tissue paper in the rain. And then uh, also moralizing versus judging. The left will tell you, don't judge. Don't judge. Judging is condemnation. I'm judging you if I say you should go to hell. That's a judgment. If I say you're doing things wrong, you shouldn't do that or you shouldn't do it that way, I'm not judging. I'm moralizing. So that's the best comeback whenever somebody accuses you uh, or says that you're making it, you're judging. You shouldn't judge. Don't judge. You tell them I'm doing no such thing. I'm moralizing. And that will, uh, again, freeze them in place. So, um, and when I come back, a, uh, a little lesson from an episode of Law and Order. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I was watching, uh, this is an episode I've seen uh, basically a long time ago, but it illustrates a very good, this little clip, it's about uh, 10, 15 seconds long, and it illustrates uh, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about neutrality. Here it goes. Thank you. Um, what uh, this is episode is this clip of the episode is illustrating is again neutrality. He's asked a pointed question. Uh, it's basically a yes or no question. If you look at Ben Stone as being the guy that's a lefty and um, Robinette as being a conservative, you can see the action here, the dynamic. Um, Robinette is asking him a yes or no question, a binary question: Did I sell out? And Ben Stone won't answer. He won't give him a simple, straight answer. There's three possible answers there. Yes, no, or I don't know. But instead, he comes up with this uh, gibberish, this neutral, bland crap. There's no other way to, really to describe it. And when, when you're watching the episode, he tilts his head to one side uh, when he's saying this. And uh, he gets a faraway look in his eye. And, it's, and he used all that to sell this BS as some kind of wisdom. You know? And Robinette challenges it a little bit with this, is this a man in the mirror speech? Uh, so he kind of mocks uh, that whole kind of thing. And Ben Stone is not, again, he asked him really another yes or no question. Is this a man in the mirror speech? Yes or no? And Ben Stone won't answer it. He, he changes the subject, but he does it in such a way that it sounds as though he's still on subject. Now, um, you're going to experience this kind of thing every day with your relatives, with your friends. Every time you go and ask them, say for advice, what should I do here? How should I handle this? Should I do X or should I do Y? Or, again, ask, being asked a yes or no question. Uh, am, I a, am I a sellout? And your friends aren't going to answer it. They're going to hem and haw and BS their way through. Okay, so, um, and what you need to do is be firm with that. Excuse me, that's not what I'm talking about. What I asked is, am I a sellout? Yes. 
or no? Uh, and be firm about it. And if they refuse to answer, then give them an answer. Okay, your answer is that you don't know. That's fine. Thank you very much and walk away. That's the way the conversation should have ended with uh, Robinette and Stone and should and end with your friends. I had a, a friend that was asked me a question about a former girlfriend. He met a former girlfriend. He ran into her and uh, he had they had uh, been dating and uh, she wanted to get married. He didn't. Uh, and so she ended up uh, marrying somebody else. So he was thinking about whether or not you know, he had regrets about the decision. He asked me, do you think I did the right thing in walking away from that relationship? And I told him yes. And I told him why. And that's just as important. You can just throw yes or no out, taking, taking a guess. But if you really don't know, say, I don't know. If you do, then you say yes, and this is why. Or no, and this is why not. And I told him, this is why. This is why you did the right thing. He told me that he'd asked the same question of many of his friends and that I was the only one that gave him a straight answer. So uh, it is true conservatives that are realistic and being binary, making accepting responsibility for decisions is realistic. And the only way that you can do that is with answering yes or no questions. You're not, it is not realistic to BS your way through a conversation. And it's certainly not the way to uh, make friends. So be of good cheer. The universe is benevolent and success is to be expected. Therefore, Soros has no authority, no power, and he cannot win. Think about it. On the next episode, Hugh Hewitt, Rick Edelman, and Opinion versus Reality. Uh, I apologize for the earlier interruption for the alarm. I'll make sure that doesn't happen again. And uh, that concludes another episode of The Drill. Be honest, be smart, and be beautiful. I'm Ron, and that's The Drill.